Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Plasterita Bible Church. Great to have you with us today. Let me invite you to come on in and grab a seat as we get going with our first Lord's Day of the New Year. So I should say Happy New Year, because technically when we were together last, it was the last day of last year. So Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. If you're visiting this morning, we want to give you a special welcome, just saying thanks again for coming and worshiping with us today. Make sure you stop by the welcome table out on the patio. We'll get some more information we'd love to give you about our church, and we would also like to just make a little record of your visit and make sure that we're available to serve you in any way that we can. Hopefully that you'll be encouraged and blessed in your time here with us this morning. So we're, we're excited about the new year. Lots of students coming back. Lots of families have been traveling, and and um, this is a great time for us to, to, uh, to hunker back down in God's Word and in, uh, in this building where we can worship and fellowship together. So let me run through a few announcements. We have a, a number of them as it's the new, new year here, obviously. The first one is Awana and Ransom um, both start next Wednesday. So there's no Awana this week, and there's no official Ransomed in the normal sense, but we are having actually a Ransomed game night. So Ransomed is meeting for a game Game night this Wednesday the 10th from 6.30 to 8.30, but the, the normal ransom format will roll out next uh, Wednesday on the 17th. So again, no Awana this week. Ransom is meeting for a game night 6.30 to 8.30. We also wanted their youth group, Ransom, this name of our youth group, to know that we're going to be heading down to the Poverty Encounter. That's just down in Silmar there at the Children's Hunger Fund. It's a great two-hour experience of touring the facility and serving some and learning about what children around the world suffer through with poverty. And so that's going to be on January the 20th. There's a small cost for each student to attend that. And you'll also receive some community service. And so the registration for attending the Poverty Encounter is available on the website. And if you have any other questions about that, you can talk to Josh Dojereau. All right, Mighty Men, we are starting this Wednesday. Okay, so again, we're here this Wednesday. Mighty Men, come and join us. We're going to be looking at the first couple of chapters of Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. All the information's on the website. Website. If you didn't get the book yet or you haven't read yet, just come. If you did get the book, I got a quiz ready for you. All right, so you guys come and we're going to have a great time together from 6 30 to 8 30 every uh, Wednesday night. Mighty Man again starting this Wednesday. I'll see you up there in the fireside room at 6 30. Ladies Bible study, we're also going to be gearing up and getting started later this month on January the 30th on Tuesday mornings at 9 30 and again in the evening at 6 30. You're studying Esther and uh, you're able to, to get that book, um, and um, there's a $25 registration fee, which includes the book, and that price goes up uh, on January 22nd, but the registration's open for our women's Bible study again, and uh, you can register online. If you have any questions, talk to one of the ladies. Lots of our women are involved in this study. It's uh, this women's Bible study. It's a great time to come together on Tuesday mornings, and again on Tuesday night if you work or homeschool on Tuesday morning. So ladies Bible study, again, starting at the end of the month. And then we have a marriage retreat. So we had been a long time, way too long, without having any marriage retreat. And so we had one last year, and it went fantastic. So we're doing it again this year. It's going to be February the 16th and the 17th out in Ventura. We'll be staying there at the Crown Plaza, which is that hotel right on the beach. And our speaker is Sean Farrell. Sean Farrell is an elder down in uh, Murrieta, serving at Faith uh, Bible Church uh, together with Chris Mueller. And uh, he's a good friend of many of us here that uh, have known Sean for, for years, but he'll be the speaker. He'll also be preaching at, at Placerita that Sunday. And so the, the retreat costs 35 bucks. That's pretty cheap, right, to come to a marriage retreat for 35 bucks. But then you also need to pay for your room uh, at the hotel. So that's a little bit more pricey. But all that information is on the website. You go and check it out. Register. The website will then send you to the hotel where you'll make your own accommodations at the hotel. And we look forward to having you again Friday evening the 16th and uh, on, uh, on uh, Saturday the 17th uh, for our marriage retreat. And then equipping classes, they're going to be starting up next week because we're going to go back to our two uh, services next week. So we have the 
The first class is going to be God and government. It begins uh, next Sunday, and um, I say it's the first class. It's actually at 1045 is God and government because the... Um, the uh, college group will be meeting in the first hour next week. But the topic for the adult Bible study is God and government. It'll be three weeks in a row, and Pat Hamlin will be teaching that. And then we'll pivot from God and government to systematic theology year three, and that'll begin in February, and it'll cover things like angels, demons, the church, and end times. And so that'll all be the adult equippings the second hour, 1045, whereas the, um, the college group, I'm drawing a blank, Josh, Thank you. The Junction is uh, our college uh, Bible study uh, equipping class time that meets uh, during the first hour. So that all starts next week. Our next slide shows you that. The two-service schedule, in case you forgot, uh, says it, at, that it's at 9 a.m. and 10.45. All right, so 9 a.m., 10.45, and then there's equipping hour classes going on during the opposite hour, and all of that kicks off next week. Sound good? If you have any questions, it's all here on your bulletin. Don't worry, people. It's all right here. You can scan it. There's QR codes. It's on the website, and uh, we're just excited to kind of get get going again. I've got a couple of kids at home. They've been like, Dad, I'm just bored. I'm bored. I'm ready to get back to school. We're ready for church to be back in full swing. Is that you? If that's you this morning, can I just see your hand? You are ready for church to be back in full swing. Thank you for the five of you, the five of you who, who, who enjoy being here more than just this main service. If you have a Bible with you, let me invite you to open up to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, on the first Sunday of the month, we participate in the Lord's table. So I, I, I read a New Testament passage, and this morning it's Philippians 3. So let me invite you to stand with me, if you're able, in honor of God's Word, and let's look at this important chapter, a familiar chapter for most of us of Paul writing to the church in Philippi. Here's what he writes in chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else think he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join me or join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory in they, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. From it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. 
Amen. You may be seated. Father, it's with great joy that we reflect on Philippians 3 this morning, a favorite chapter for many of us as believers who are seeking to imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. We want to be very aware that we have nothing to show for ourselves. Our best efforts only count as rubbish, and we put it all aside this morning that we might gain Christ and be found in him, not in any righteousness that comes from the law, but the righteousness that comes from God and depends on faith. And so I pray, God, that this morning we would press on to make it our own because Christ Jesus has made us his own. And so in this, in this chapter of clear sanctification, encouragement, and challenge, I pray that we would take up this new challenge and encouragement on this first Lord's Day of the new year. And that we would press on this year, God, that we would quickly get rid of those things that linger, those things that try to pull us down, those temptations that sometimes get the best of us. We confess that before you. We pray that you would fill us anew with fresh power and with contentment, with godliness in our hearts would be great gain. And I pray that as we kick off this new year, God, that you would establish in us just a greater um, hunger to be in your presence, that we would draw near to you, knowing that you draw near to us, that we would resist the devil, and we know that he will flee. And we come to you this morning by faith through the gospel, through Christ, to tell you that we love you and that we want to be satisfied in you, and we want you to be reigning over our hearts this morning. God, we pray for the world that we live in. We're grateful for the missionaries we support around the globe. We want to pray for the Hurleys that serve you in Uganda. We pray for the team that works with them. We're so thankful to have the Ratunas with us this this morning, Mark and Stephen here. And I pray, God, that you would just bless that effort in Kuba Matwe as Mark teaches there at the seminary, as they uh, continue to shine light through their church there, that you would be glorified in Uganda in that ministry ministry and in that setting even this morning. God, we want to pray for our country today. We lift up America to you and we continue to pray every week for our leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom and that they would make decisions that would be uh, filled with justice and reasonable knowledge. And we know apart from you, uh, our country has no hope. But in Christ, we know that we can, as the church, raise up our our. Um, our convictions to to live out our faith and to point people to Christ and to bring um, truth to bear in conversations that we have in a way that we would always be unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation. God, so help us as your church to continue to represent you well here in our community. We're thankful that we're not alone. There are other faithful churches right here who love you and serve you, and, and we want to pray for Santa Carita Baptist Church this morning. We're so thankful for a church that would stand on the truth of the gospel. We pray for their pastor this morning, uh, David. Pastor David, that you would encourage him and he would be faithful to uh, preach your word and proclaim your truth, God. And we're just thankful this morning to be back together from a lot of travel, a lot of uh, different types of schedules in our personal lives. And we're, we're back, Lord, here this morning uh, to fellowship, to sing, to worship, to hear the word being preached and proclaimed. And we're excited about the opportunity to do that this morning, God. So would you be glorified in our hearts, in our midst today, as we continue to lift high the name of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Happy New Year. Let's stand together and sing. And we'll sing. Uh, we'll start the year singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And uh, uh, worship our Lord who he hears us today. Christians join to sing, hallelujah, amen, loud praise to Christ our King, hallelujah, amen, let all with heart and voice before His throne rejoice, praise is His gracious choice, hallelujah, amen. Left 
your hearts on high. Hallelujah, amen. Their praises fill the sky. Hallelujah, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend. His love shall never end. Hallelujah, amen. Praise yet our Christ again. Hallelujah, amen. Life shall not end the strain. Hallelujah, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, His goodness will adore, singing forevermore. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Church family, I'd like to uh, learn a new song. Uh, today, at least here at uh, Plasterita Bible. We're singing uh, uh, Christ is mine forevermore. The chorus of the first chorus is, but mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though I fall, his love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us that we can be reconciled to the Father. And then I am his forevermore. Christ, the Lord has adopted us as sons and daughters, as servants, as sons and daughters that uh, forever uh, for the Most High. We also sing of uh, the fact that we are pilgrims uh, through this place, that this is not our home. Heaven is our home. But while we are here, because the, the world hated Christ, the world would hate us. The Lord promised us that. But the Lord has also provided a way for us to withstand that as we look toward our heavenly future where we walk with the Lord forever. Let's sing these, song, these words together. We'll sing the first verse and the first chorus. I'll teach it. Please sing with me, but we'll sing it again as we learn it. So. Mine are days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Him Yet I look for worldly treasure And forsake the King of Kings But mine is hope in my Redeemer Though I fall, His love is sure For Christ has paid that again. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him. Yet I look for worldly treasures and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though I fall, His love for Christ has paid for every failing. I am His forevermore. Mine are tears in times of sorrow. work. 
work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way. One with Christ I will encounter, heart and hatred for his name. But mine is armor for this battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said,
trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness. My value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. As the men come forward, let's pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we are satisfied in you alone. Help us to be satisfied in you. Lord, help us to not hold on tightly to these worldly things, Lord, that you've blessed us with. Father, you've given us so much that we can't even count it all. Beyond what we ask or think is continually should be continually on our hearts. Father, I just pray this morning as we consider all that you've given to us, all that you've blessed us with, as we start this new year, Father, let it be a year, a week, a day, where every day we give to you all that we can. Father, of this offering that we give to you now, Father, I pray that you would bless it. I pray that you would use it for your glory, for your kingdom. And through it, Lord, that your name would be magnified throughout this world. We just thank you for the opportunity to give back to you, Father, from what you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that Seeds our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount and poor there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled grace, grace God's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace.
Well, thanks for leading us again in worship this morning, and it's a great joy to be able to sing about God's grace, and we're going to be able to hear from a special uh, preacher, a special friend. He's well known to most of us here. I'm introducing to you Mark Ratuna. Mark Ratuna is from Nairobi, Kenya, and then he relocated just for a few months to Kuba Matwe, Uganda, where he worked with Shannon and Danielle there for a few months before coming over to the States to do his Masters of Divinity at the Master's Seminary. So he was here with us during that time. He and his lovely wife, Margaret. Of course, Stephen is still with us. He's over at the Master's University. He has two other children, Stephanie and Stefan, and they're all back in Uganda serving there, where Mark is the one of the lead teachers of the Shepherd's Training Center, which is training pastors all through Uganda uh, to preach the word expositionally uh, and to just be faithful in their pulpit ministries. And so he teaches preaching there at the seminary, and uh, he is in town doing his doctorate of ministry. So he's here back at the Master's Seminary. Uh, they have a class that, uh, for the doctorate program that meets in, in uh, July and again in January. So he's right in the middle of that training. And so when I heard he was back in town, I'm like, Mark, you got to preach at PBC uh, this first Sunday of the new year. So we're excited to have him. I am preaching Romans starting next week because a lot of you are asking me, are we starting Romans this morning? And it's like, no, it's next week. All right. So next week we are going to kick off Romans and I can't wait. I know you'll be blessed. But this morning, what a special privilege to have Mark Ratuna with us. And so Mark, would you come and bless us with the word? Let's give him a warm welcome, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? You will have to wait one more week for Romans. Endure me, survive me today. <laughs> and uh, next week you will have Romans. I bring you a lot of greetings. Um, me being at PBC, I, I, I don't know how many golf fans we have here, people who play golf. I don't understand golf, I, but there's people who love it. Um, and I was told that uh, Tiger Woods, his most, his favorite golf course is Pebble Beach that he enjoys uh, playing there. I'm not sure. Maybe he's, it's because he won a lot of uh, tournaments there. Uh, Tiger Woods, he has Pebble Beach for his favorite place in California. I have PBC for my favorite place <laughs> here in California. So it is a joy to be back. Um, I bring you lots and lots of greetings from my family, um, my wife and my two children. Um, uh, last month, my wife and I, we celebrated 22 years of marriage. We are growing old together. And I, I saw some um, growing old American jokes. They said, uh, you know you're growing old when uh, you, you drop your new iPhone to the ground and you decide it is cheaper to buy a new phone <laughs> than to try to pick that one up. That, that, uh, and then they said, uh, you know you're growing old when it's the doctor who tells you to slow down, not the traffic officer. So my wife and I, uh, God has been super gracious to us, very, very kind to us, and we're grateful to be back in Uganda. PBC has a very special place in our hearts, and we thank God for Pastor Adam, and we thank God for the elders here, and just, uh, just the church itself. I bring you a lot of greetings from Shannon Hurley. Um, uh, more than just being a leader, he's a friend and he's a brother. And so we bring you a lot of love and a lot of greetings, and we thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Um, because of time, we will go straight into the Word. Um, 300 years ago, uh, there was a ship that set sail from Havana, Cuba, um, heading to Spain because part of what they carried was a gift for the king of Spain. There was a, a very special golden coin that they were taking to the king, part of the treasury that they had on board that sheep. But uh, as uh, it would happen, that sheep never made it to Spain. It sunk off the coast of Florida. Uh, and so there was a hurricane, there was a storm in the sea, and that sheep uh, found itself sinking. Uh, recently, 50 years ago, they discovered that sheep, and they discovered that that sheep has a lot of treasure, that uh, they estimate that it could have as much as $400 million worth of treasure, 
$400 million. Um, there's a family, they are professional um, treasure hunters. They are called the Schmeitz family. They have already retrieved 50 million worth of treasure. So there's 350 million that they are yet to retrieve. It's still down there underwater. Um, I, I don't want to give anyone ideas. Uh, <laughs> But uh, they, they own exclusive rights to digging up that treasure. Um, so you, you think about that treasure and you think about the value of that treasure, that's, that's, a, lot of, uh, that's, that's a lot of money. It's, it's, it's valuable property, valuable treasure. And uh, you would be you know, interested in going to dig that up and uh, you know, finding uh, uh, some potion for yourself. Uh, I, want, I want to say that what we are about to do this morning is, is go on a treasure hunt. The Bible says that there's treasure that you should pursue much more than you would pursue any other treasure. I'm so glad the music that we sang is very much in line with what we are about to look at in Colossians chapter number 2. So please go with me to Colossians chapter number 2. And the reason we're talking about treasure this morning is because of what Paul says in verse number three. Paul makes uh, an incredible statement about Christ in verse number three of chapter two in the book of Colossians. Paul says concerning Christ, it is in him that all Treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So we will hydroplane over this entire chapter this morning. It has 23 verses, and we will try to look at all of them in the few minutes that we have. Please allow me to read through it, and then we will break it down together. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in, powerful working, in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. 
These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world? Do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What Paul presents to us in this passage is treasure much more than the Schmite family has ownership of. The treasure is a person. The treasure is Christ himself. Paul presents him to us in a, a section of his letter that he intended to use to defend the Colossian church from heretic teaching that was threatening to infiltrate the church. So he's on a defense mission, and that's the title of our uh, sermon this morning, Defense Against Delusion. I was looking at that this morning, and I noticed it forms an, an acrostic. It's an acronym for DAD, D-A-D. I think that's what dads should do. They should defend their families against delusion. But anyway, we, we are looking at Paul's attempt to defend the Colossian church against delusion because this word is used in verse number four. In verse number four, he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. There was a threat. Heretic false teaching was threatening the church in Colossae. And Paul writes in his letter a section that includes a few items that will help defend them. So what we notice here in this chapter is that there are three epistolary sections um, that will help you and I understand how incredibly in, in, intensely Paul wanted to defend this church from the threat of false teaching. So what we will see together is from verse number one to verse number two C, we see Paul express to us a pastoral concern. Paul was not the pastor of this church. Paul was not the founder of this church. He had not met the people who composed the membership of this church, but he had a very deep concern for them. He had a pastoral concern. Even though he was an apostle, he was a shepherd at heart. He was a pastor. And he had concern, and we see it in verse number 1 and verse number 2, all the way through verse number 2c. It says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle. That word translated struggle there is a Greek word, agona. And you can even tell for you English speakers that it sounds familiar to a word that is very, you know, common to us, agona. Sounds like agon, agonize. Paul is agonizing over this church. He is in agony over this church. He has some great agony, some great struggle. Something is robbing Paul his sleep at night. When he thinks about the church in Colossae, he's agonizing over them. And he will tell us what this is about because he's, he's obviously concerned about the threat of heresy. There's a, there's a threat of false teaching that might penetrate and infiltrate this congregation. And so he agonizes over them. He has a great pastoral concern for them. 
And so he says he has, he wants them to know that he has great struggle for them, for the church in Colossae and for the church in Laodicea. And he says, even for those who have never met him face to face, pastors agonize over their congregation when they notice that there's threats of false teaching that could infiltrate their congregations. I promise you, I know Pastor Adam very well, and he has great concern for the flock that he shepherds here. And if there was any threat of heresy to penetrate this congregation, that would deny this man of God sleep at night. That is what any, that is what any biblical shepherd would do. He is concerned over the spiritual welfare of his flock. And so Paul had not pastored this church. There's churches that Paul had pastored, but still at an apostolic level, Paul has shepherding concern for the church in Colossae. He is tossing and turning at night. I don't know what keeps you awake at night. I don't know what denies you sleep at night. But Paul is agonizing over the church in Colossae. He's tossing and turning as he thinks about the heresy that could infiltrate them. So we see a, a pastoral concern here, and he says his desire is that the Colossian church, the Colossian congregation would be encouraged. He says in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged. How will their hearts be encouraged? He says two things here. He says, being knit together in love, if there's something that can bring great encouragement to a congregation, is the abundance of love in that congregation. But it doesn't stop there, because people always say love is the answer, love is the answer, love is the answer. There's truth, truth to that, but that is half truth, because he says here, Knit together in love to reach all the reaches of full assurance of understanding the knowledge of God's mystery. Um, this version translates it as knowledge, but it's, it's the truth of God's mystery. That they would under, come to an understanding of the truth of God's mystery. So what Paul is saying is this. These are the two conjoined twins that would bring encouragement to any congregation. It is the abundance of love and the abundance of truth. Not just love. Love and truth in the congregation. If, if you want to find a congregation that is discouraged, a congregation that is, there's no, there's no encouragement in them, it's a congregation that is deficient of this. Paul says this congregation being knitted together in love and understanding the truth of God's mystery would encourage them. It is at this point I want to echo Pastor John, Pastor John MacArthur, who says, loveless truth. It's possible to have truth without love. So loveless truth, he says loveless truth is hypocrisy. If you are full of truth and devoid of love, you're a hypocrite. Hypocrisy. Loveless truth. But then it's also possible to flip it, swing it to the other side of the spectrum and find, truth, uh, and find truthless love. So there's loveless truth and truthless love. So truthless love is heresy. If you're full of love, and no truth, you're a heretic. You're a heretic. So truthless love is heresy. Loveless truth is hypocrisy. Paul says this congregation will be greatly encouraged if this congregation walks in those two conjoined twins. Having an abundance of love and having an abundance of truth. And that will encourage any group of believers. So Paul has a concern for them, and he gives them an antidote from the word go of what will keep them on the straight and the narrow. So we see from verse 1 through verse 2, C, we see 
the pastoral concern he had. From verse 2D all the way through verse 3, we see a profound conviction. That's what we see. So we are looking at basically the just, just big picture uh, view. We are flying over this chapter. Coming here, uh, we were told the captain announced and said we are flying at 39,000 feet above sea level. That's what we are doing with this passage. We are flying 39,000 feet above sea level on chapter number two. So we looked at the pastoral concern he had, and then we see he, he presents to us a very profound conviction in verse 2D through verse 3. He says this. He mentions Christ. He says Christ, and then he, he gives a prepositional phrase here. He says, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul was convicted about this. This was a position he held unbendingly. He was claiming for some exclusivity here about Jesus. He says, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures, all the treasures, meaning there's no drop of treasure of wisdom or treasure of gold, uh, of uh, of knowledge outside Christ. Christ has exclusive ownership. All wisdom, all knowledge is contained in Christ. Outside Christ, there is no drop, no single drop of wisdom or knowledge. Now, people hate the Christian faith because of exclusive claims. Christianity is not popular because Christianity is a very exclusive faith. Um, when it comes to the way to heaven, the Christian faith does not give opportunity or even um, avenue for there being two or three ways. It's always one way. Jesus Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those exclusive claims and exclusive statements in God's word make God's word an object of many people's hate. Now, that's just human nature. We, we don't like boundaries. When boundaries are drawn, we get offended, and we want, we want to push back against boundaries. Um, I'm, I'm very sure if, if God had said there's a hundred ways to heaven, we would demand for a hundred and one. I'm very sure. We would say, why not a hundred and one? Why just a hundred? Okay? Even if he said there's a thousand ways to heaven, we would say we want a thousand and one. That's just human nature. We, we hate boundaries, but there's a God in heaven who reigns sovereign over his creation, and he decides where boundaries are drawn. And we don't decide that. We are, you are creature, you cannot play the role of creator. We are creation. Creator, he draws the boundaries. And as far as the salvation of your soul, God says there's only one way you will escape his wrath. There's only one way you will escape his judgment. And that's looking to Christ for salvation. And there's no debating that. There's no reviewing that. That is just how exclusive God's word is. Here Paul makes an exclusive statement again. And he says there's only one whom, it is Christ and Christ alone, that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge dwells in. It was very important for the Colossians to hear this because of what Paul is going to do next. We know Christ to be our pal of great price. Our hearts and our minds are singularly focused on Jesus. Like that parable says, we discover that that field has 
a pearl, and we sell everything else so that we can buy the field. We sell everything else so that we can be with the pearl. And so we leave everything else out so that we can pursue Jesus and Jesus alone. And so Jesus and his preciousness to us is a non-negotiable. We love him. He is the center of our lives. Jesus is not an accessory. He is the center of our lives. Jesus is not part of our lives. He is our life. Jesus is not number one to us. He is the only one to us. We, we have an exclusive relationship with Jesus that allows room for nothing else. And if you're here and you're a believer, and you know, or, or you claim to be a believer, and you know that is not true of you, you would better examine yourself and find out whether you be in the faith. If Jesus is not your exclusive if you're not possessed with him, if other things, if your heart is di divided with the things that you pursue, if, if there's a division there, you, you ought, and, and it's a good thing that this is the beginning of the year, that, that you, can, you can take time to stock take and just evaluate things and ask yourself, do you have an exclusive passion for Christ? Or is your passion divided. If it is, biblically speaking, you, you have a lot to worry about. Now, we, we all have our um, preferences in terms of sports and things like that. Just be careful. There's lines that can be crossed. God does see your heart. Um, anything in your life? that you think about more than you think about God is an idol. Anything in your life that you love more than you love God, anything in your life that you fear more than you fear God is an idol. And you ask yourself, how healthy is your relationship with Christ? Are those claims you make about being a believer, are they genuine? Do they stand the test of time? Jesus claims an exclusive walk with his people and um, he doesn't share well. He does not. He, he, he is very jealous. Just like pastors are jealous for their congregation, Jesus is jealous for your soul. I, I know the story about Oprah Winfrey, that she heard that and she walked away from, from the church. I, I think she wasn't a believer. I don't think she was. A believer wouldn't do that. When somebody told her that Jesus or God is jealous for her, she got offended, but it, it's, it's a fact. It does not change. So what we see in verse number 2, D to verse number 3, is a profound conviction that there is no treasure, there is no drop of treasure of wisdom or treasure of knowledge outside Christ. From verse number 4 all the way to verse number 23, Paul begins aiming and shooting at the heretic uh, teachings that were threatening this church. Now, there is one, you know, there, there's been debates of whether, what, what was the error that was threatening the Col Colossian church? Was it the Gnostic error? error? Um, I, I have been this whole week with, uh, with Dr. Schreiner, and we're going through the theology of Paul, Pauline theology in 1 Corinthians, and he says, you know, the Gnostic error or heresy was not a thing until the second century. Um, and this is the first century that we're talking about. So, but there's elements of it. It is very clear that whatever error, whatever heresy was going on in the Colossian circle was, uh, was a Jewish kind of heresy. It was not necessarily, you know, Greek in its nature. But there's elements of, uh, you know, the Gnostic era here. And so let's, let's look at the four strands 
of what this heresy was. Whatever the Colossian heresy was, it manifested itself in, in four different ways. And Paul addresses each and every one of them. So from verse number four all the way to verse number 10, I have labeled it, um, what we see here is a protective counsel. Paul is going to provide counsel uh, to the Colossian church. He is going to provide apostolic counsel on how to combat the heresy that was threatening this church. So he provides a prophetic, uh, 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 a protective counsel from verse number four through verse number 23. Now let's break down the heresy because we are flying 39,000 feet above sea level over this passage. We will take verse number four all the way to verse number 10 and say that what we see there is we see elements of humanism. Humanism. There's, there's a philosophy uh, that is threatening the church um, of, in, in Colossae from verse number four through verse number 10. He says this plausible argument. Um, these guys are very smart in the way they talk. They're orators. They, they, they can put together phrases and words and, and they can make a case. Paul says, I say this in order that you may not be deluded with plausible arguments. That's how philosophy manifests itself. Philosophy manifests itself with a lot of um, attractive, um, uh, what do you call it, Attra attractive statements. You know, it, it shows itself like, like something that, that is, is, is very catchy, very pithy. That's how philosophy manifests itself. So in verse 4 through verse number 10, it says, I say this in order that you may not be deluded with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanks." giving, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. That's the, that, there's the word right there in verse number 10, verse number 8, by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Uh, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. We know the Greek word for philosophy, uh, philosophia. Philo, we know what that means, is love or affection. And sophia is wisdom. So the love for wisdom. Philosophy was threatening the church in Colossae. So I, I, I just decided to call it humanism. Anything that, any wisdom, any knowledge that seeks to exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ, for me, is very humanistic. So I just said, this is, this is just humanism, this, this philosophy that was threatening the church. A love for wisdom, a love for plausible arguments. At this point, I want to remind us of um, the Pilgrim's Progress. You remember the Pilgrim's Progress? Along the path, Christian meets a guy called Worldly Wise Man. He was a worldly wise man. And, and he came from a town called Canality. I don't know how many of you guys have read Pilgrim's Progress, but there's a character in Pilgrim's Progress. As Christian is heading to the celestial city, he meets this guy called Worldly Wiseman. And just like his name, he lives up to his name, by the way. And so he has advice for Christian. He says, Christian, you have a burden on your back. We know, we know the burden that Christian had on his back was his guilt of sin. And he says, how will you get rid of that burden? Because Christian says the burden was so heavy, he was sinking under the weight of that burden. And so, worldly wise men offers an advice. He says, Christian, don't listen to anything evangelist told you, okay? Instead of going that treacherous path, that difficult path, I have a suggestion for you. He says, why don't you go to this city and you will meet two guys. One of those guys is called legalism 
and the other one is called civility. Okay? Go to them and they will help you get rid of that burden. So he's saying legalism will help you. Civility will help you. Civility fits into philosophy. Being civilized, walking the, the road of philosophy, lofty ideas and lofty human thoughts, and worldly wise men is advising Christian to go that path, and his guilt of sin, his problem of sin, will be dealt with. We know civility does not deal with the problem of sin. Philosophy does not deal with the problem of sin. No matter how exalted the thoughts of man are, God will not invite human intelligence in his program of salvation. In the Old Testament, God instructed Moses to build an altar. And he says, Moses, I want you to build me an altar. When you build that altar, I want you to go and take natural stones. Put those stones together. But do not allow the tools of man to shape any of those stones. He says, I want to see those stones ugly and as natural as they are. I do not want to see any input you trying to hewn the stones. Don't bring your intellectualism here. Your intellectualism robs the gospel of his power. Human intellectualism is not invited. Human intellectualism pollutes the gospel. Any human effort employed to make the gospel look presentable is not welcomed by heaven. Your philosophy will take you to hell. Philosophy does not save. Philosophy threatens the gospel. Philosophy defiles the gospel. That's why in the pilgrim's progress, civility got Christian into trouble. It doesn't matter how civilized you are. It doesn't matter how high and lofty you think your thoughts are. Your thoughts, your lofty thoughts will sink you to the depths of hell. So whatever the world of academia has to offer will not save humanity. It will not. Whatever I see people going to the Oriental, they go to China to seek some kind of um, whatever they seek there. <laughs> and I'm saying it will not work. Human intellectualism will not work. It is not welcome. The gospel, God will not allow you to take the tools of man and shape those stones. Human intellectualism defiles the gospel. Philosophy defiles the gospel. And Paul saw the threat. Whatever the, because Paul has not given us details, but he just says there's a, this philosophy concerned here. Whether it was Greek philosophy or, or, or Jewish philosophy, whatever it was, it was threatening to infiltrate the Colossian church, and Paul has to fight against it. So let me just mention this, and then we, we go over the, the solutions that Paul offers for each and every one of these heresies. So there was humanism, we see it in verse 4 through 10, and then there was legalism, we see it from verse 11 through 17. We see the problem of legalism. I mean, he talks about circumcision, he talks about baptism, um, and, 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 and he talks about the feasts of the Old Testament. We know there's legalism concerned there. And Paul will address that. From verse 11, he says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Um, obviously, there was Judaizers that we know were threatening the church in Galatia, the Galatian church. Um, you know, guys who would come and say, yes, you're, you're a Christian, but for you to, re, re, um, uh, you know, the gospel is there, but then for you to really be accepted into the fold of God, you must be circumcised. Um, it, it looks like there was elements of that in, in this Colossian heresy because Paul begins to address the issue of circumcision here. 
and, and he addresses the issue of uh, days and diets and things like that from verse 11. He says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands uh, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all. You, you have to love some of those little particles in there. Um, it says he has forgiven us all of our trespasses. And it's in the past tense, meaning that this is something that uh, you know, God has done, and it's, um, it, it, the effects continue to carry on into, into the present, and will do so even into the future. He has forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt uh, that stood against us with all its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Um, therefore, let no one ju pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival. The festivals were the, the annual ceremonies that they held uh, or a new moon. They had monthly ceremonies as well or a Sabbath that was a weekly ceremony. So whatever they did on a weekly basis, whatever they did on a monthly basis, whatever they did on an annual basis, Paul says, let no one question you over that. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. We will come back to verse 17 as we, as, we, as we wind up. But that section basically addresses the threat of legalism. And Paul says that's a threat to the gospel. The gospel will not entertain human works. We do not work for our justification. You, you cannot please God by your works, it is impossible. The picture that has always been drawn is a picture of a pole, like a, like a metallic round pole that stretches all the way to heaven, and it, it has grease on it, grease. And you're trying to climb up, and you're trying to climb up. Good luck. You, you, will, you will get nowhere trying to climb up in your own efforts to reach God will not work. Legalism distorts the gospel. We are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. No part of human work is welcomed there. So that's what we see in verse 11 through 17. And then in verse number 18 through 19, what we see is mysticism mysticism, verse 18 and 19. Let no one disqualify you in insisting uh, on asceticism and, and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions. There's visions and worship of angels here, puffed up without a reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the, the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows into the growth that is from God. Verse number 20 to 23, even though asceticism has been mentioned in verse 18, what we see is Paul expounding on it in verse 20 through 23. He says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world? You, do you submit to regulations? Um, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referring to the things that, are, that all perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. I love, I'd love to just highlight that small little statement that Paul makes at the end of verse 23. He says, these have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You see that list there? Humanism, legalism, mysticism, asceticism. None of those, none of them, they are impotent, completely powerless 
in helping you or delivering you from the power of the flesh. None of them will help you to stop the indulgence of the flesh. You can, you can employ all the human wisdom there is, and your flesh will still dominate you and defeat you. You can try and be as legalistic as you want, and your flesh will still fail you. You will still indulge in the desires of the flesh. So all this, Paul looked at that. You see, the reason why Paul is tossing and turning and he is agonizing is because of that list there. Those things were threatening the church. And Paul has to write a letter to the Colossian congregation and say, watch out. I do not want you to be deluded. So he's offering them a defense against delusion. And the defense is what? He calls them back to the basics. And he says, you look to Christ. You look to Christ. He reminds them of the person of Christ. And he reminds them of the work of Christ. Because that list there threatens to distort the person and the work of Christ. And Paul has to highlight that. And he has to shoot each one of them down. So that this congregation will remain focused exclusively on Christ and Christ alone. Because of what he did. So Christ and Christ alone has offered what will deliver us from the, from the indulgence of the flesh. He says whether it's legalism and the things that legalism entails, if you look at the Old Testament and all the things that God expected through the Mosaic law, that God expected the children of Israel to observe, Paul says they were all a shadow of things to come. And the substance is Christ. If you insist, if you insist on humanism, or if, you, if you insist on legalism, let's say for example, you are insisting on something ridiculous. I've just told you that last month, my wife and I, we, we celebrated our 22nd anniversary. I'm glad I married my wife, not her shadow. Anyone who insists on legalism is insisting on marrying or being united with a shadow at the expense of the substance. Christ is the substance. You are not justified by God because of something you do. You're justified by God because of what Christ has done on your behalf. What he has done for you. So what has Christ done for you? Let's go back to what Paul says in verse number 14, verse number 13, 14, and 15. It says here, and you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. Again, Pauline um, style of just helping us understand the full extent of our inability to do anything about the problem we had. Uh, he says that to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2, and he's saying that to the Colossians in Colossians 2. He reminds them that they were dead, completely lifeless, incapable of doing anything about their situation. In our natural state, in our unregenerate state, Scripture clearly teaches that we are dead, dead in our trespasses, completely unable, incapable of doing anything to bring salvation to ourselves. That's what you are, anyone in this room that is not a believer. You are dead in your sins. The Bible says you are a slave to your sin. You are completely helpless. You have no power to overcome your sin in and of yourself. Scripture says you are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Circumcision involves the cutting off 
of a part of your flesh, um, which, which symbolizes um, to divorce yourself from the flesh and its power. And you are incapable of doing that for yourself. You who is a non-believer here, you are spiritually uncircumcised. The flesh is still attached to you, and the flesh dominates you and controls you. And the flesh will lead you to judgment and destruction. Completely helpless to save yourself. So he says, you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. It is God who made you alive. And how did he do it? He forgave all your trespasses. Why? He says in verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So he, he does give that small little um, first century triumphant general example there that he, he, he tries to paint, use that to paint a picture of what Christ did and what Christ achieved or accomplished at Calvary. That, that it was customary back in those days in the first century that a conquering general would come back home dragging all those, uh, you know, whoever he defeated, um, dragging him on his chariot, on, on his horse, you know, just publicly bringing up and shame to them. And he says that's what Christ did on the cross. That Christ, he took your debt, the record of debt that stood against you, um, kind, of, kind of painting a picture that, that God keeps a record. He keeps a record of all the rebellious acts that you committed in your elementary school, that you committed in your high school, that you committed in your college years. He keeps a record of all your wrongs. And for those of you who are in Christ, God takes that record because of what Christ has done, and he nails it to the cross of Christ, and he cancels that debt, and he declares you debt-free. That, that's what God has done, that nothing you did in your elementary school, nothing you did in your high school, nothing you did in your college days, nothing that you're doing in your adult life, nothing will count against you. That God took all that, he took the entire record, and he nailed it to the cross, and he canceled your debt. And he says, that and that alone should be our sole focus. Humanism, philosophy will not do that for us. Legalism will not do that for us. Mysticism will not do that for us. Asceticism will not do that for us. He says, Christ took the record of your debt and he nailed it to the cross. And that should be our focus. And that's why in Christ we say, all treasure of wisdom and knowledge contained in Christ and Christ alone. We will not allow philosophy to distract us. There's nothing wrong with... with, with I mean, we live in a very technologically advanced age. There's just a lot going on. Um, I, I was riding this morning from where I stay to here on what I would consider a plane on the ground. Uh, I will not say more than that, but whoever picked me up, it was a great experience. Um, and so there's just good stuff that technology has made available. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. We focus on the one who nailed our record of debt to the cross, and he canceled the debt that stood against us. It is him that we focus on. So whatever the world of academia has to offer, we have no problem with that. We will enjoy all the technology that comes our way. But we know where the focus is. Christ and Christ alone. Not Christ and humanism, not Christ and legalism, not Christ and mysticism, not Christ and asceticism. Christ and Christ alone. And so that's where we focus. Paul looked at the threat, and he had to do something about it. He wrote them a letter, and this letter is of great benefit to us even today. And so we thank God for um, 
all that Christ has made available on our behalf. In Christ, all the fullness of God, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. All the essence of Godhood dwells bodily in Christ. God has made himself accessible to us. And so we are grateful that even through what Paul wrote to the Colossians almost 2,000 years ago, is still very instructive to us today. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the purity that you desire for your people. We thank you for Paul, and we thank you for how you have used him to instruct even to this present day. We thank you for the warnings that have come our way. We pray that you will help us to heed them. Guard and guide and protect your people from error. Protect us from heresy, Lord. There's so much that threatens to come and defile and um, to come and dilute the gospel. Uh, we pray that we will be known as a people full of love and a people full of truth as well that nothing will dilute the gospel for us. Keep us focused on Christ throughout this year, throughout our lives. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much, Mark, for preaching the word to us out of Colossians 2. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that we don't have to strive for those four lists there that he kept going through, but that we have Christ. We have Christ who is our all in all. And so we're going to celebrate Christ in the sense of taking communion at the Lord's table here at the end of the service. And so the way we do that at our church is that if you are a Christian and you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ and him alone for your salvation, then we invite you to take part in communion with us. But if you're here and you've never repented, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we want to ask you to allow these elements just to pass. This is for Christians, those of us who are in Christ and who know him intimately through the gospel uh, to fellowship together with him. And if you're here and you've never been baptized, we also want to encourage you to think about also being obedient to the Lord and believers baptism. We'll be having a baptism class together with a new members class just in a month or two from now. And we'd love for you to, uh, to be baptized. And then we also would just want to remind you, if you're not a part of a Bible teaching church, that that's something that you need to consider doing as well, because as we partake in one of these ordinances of communion, we're thinking about communion, we're thinking about baptism, we're thinking about being united with Christ, and we're also just making sure that we're right with Christ and right with each other. If you're here this morning and you have some ongoing sin in your life, you could be meditating on the fact that Christ nailed it to the cross, but that's something that you still need to repent of and to make right between you and that other person, between you and the Lord, and so this is a time for us to be meditating for us to be repentant. And so I'm going to invite the men to come. They're now coming uh, down the aisle. I want you to think about some of the things I've said. Again, if you're a Christian, born again, this is for you. If you're not a Christian, let it pass and let all of us, as we sing a couple of stanzas, just think about the beauty and the treasure of Christ offering his life for us. And I'll come back in just a couple of minutes and I'll lead us through taking these elements together. But for now, let's sing, meditate, pray, and prepare our hearts.
Well, it truly is only through the body and the blood of Jesus that we can have all of our stains washed away. Again, you won't have power over the flesh through anything other than faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're remembering his sacrifice. We're remembering his death on the cross to pay for our sins in full. And with that, obviously, he was resurrected from the grave. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read this, and you can prepare that piece of bread there off the bottom of your cup if you haven't already done that. Paul writes this, he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Well, not only do we know that the body of Christ was bruised for us, was nailed to the cross for us, we know that Christ shed his blood to cleanse us and to wash us by his sacrifice. And so we read, as we continue, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Well, there should be a little basket there in the aisle that'll be coming down. You can carefully place your cup there. And we're going to sing one last stanza and uh, trust that Christ will be exalted throughout your day, throughout our time together here uh, this morning, and that you would be uh, worshiping him as he's given his life to sacrifice and to uh, be raised again from the grave so that we can have life in him. Let's sing about that now as we close. Church family, let's stand together. Lord Jesus, we sing thy power to save. We thank you for your servant, Mark, and we thank you for this opportunity today to gather as a church family to worship you in spirit and truth. We ask your blessing on us as we go from this place today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.